Okay. Well, thanks so much, uh, Eric. And we're going to now move to talking about uh, long-term, uh, long-acting antiretroviral agents for prevention and treatment. And we are very fortunate to have Turner Overton, who's a professor of medicine at the University of Alabama in Birmingham, who's going to take us through some of the latest data on uh, long-acting agents. Thanks so much, Turner. When I was a kid, um, we had been to the moon, so the moon was, while still exciting, didn't carry, I don't know, the interest. Because of Ray Bradbury, the, the Mars didn't seem so exciting. So to me, Jupiter was always the on the horizon with its red eye and all of its uh, moons. And if we were going to go somewhere, or if I were going to go somewhere as an astronaut, which I'm never going to do, I'd want to go to Jupiter. So when I look at antiretroviral therapy, you know, once we would say, oh, I'll go to the moon, but I, I think we want to go to Jupiter. So that's why I chose Jupiter in my title. And I hope you'll go on a ride with me. So here are my financial uh, relationships or my sins, as uh, John Bartlett would always say, and I always love that comment from him. And at the conclusion of my presentation, hopefully um, we'll review just briefly the state of antiretroviral therapy, although Dr. Dar did a really great job, but then talk on recent data that's been published and now um, has led to the FDA approval of of long-acting therapy for antiretroviral agents for treatment, and then some data on prevention, and then talk a little bit about the future therapies. Okay, so I've got two questions to get you started to make sure you're still awake. So, antra, so in your opinion, has antiretroviral therapy advanced all the way to its zenith? True or false? Excellent. So I agree. There's always room for improvement. And my next question, do I have to advance again? I apologize. The benefits of long-acting HIV therapy include which of the following? A, it allows providers to see patients every three years. B, it cures a patient of, all, of HIV altogether. C, it prevents sexually transmitted diseases like syphilis and chlamydia. Or D, it decreases stigma around daily HIV medications for patients. The bad thing is I can't hear the music, which is so disappointing. That was always my favorite thing. All right. I, I mean, you know, my job is done. No, of course not. Those are just questions to make sure everybody's paying attention. So I'd like to put things in perspective as I get started and think about antiretroviral therapy or give a talk, particularly about new agents, and just know where we've been and where we're going. Here's data from the Kaiser Permanente study that was just uh, published at Croy last year and has since been published um, that, that is from the Kaiser group that, that highlights the increasing life expectancy of people living with HIV. And in the top, you can see that from 2000 to 2016, the life expectancy gap has closed um, for our patients uh, on antiretroviral, or all of our patients, but specifically because of antiretroviral therapy. However, there remains a gap in terms of of that, a, a nine-year gap, which um, our patients live long, live shorter than people without HIV. And that's true even for people uh, with CD4 counts greater than 500 uh, at time of ART initiation. So there's still room for improvement. And the other piece of improvement that we need to work on is comorbidities. Now, I'm not going to speak about that. Dr. Dar spoke briefly about that. But our patients continue to have uh, excess comorbidities, cancer, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, liver, kidney, and lung disease, in excess of what they, uh, what the general population would have for any given age. And why have we had such success? Well, because of the, the current antiretroviral therapy are really tremendous. And these are the current DHS DHHS guidelines and or recommendations. And, I, and the point that I want to make, I know Dr. Dar already covered these to some degree, is just that we've, we've really transformed where we are with antiretroviral therapy over the last 20 years. I mean, if we go back even beyond that, uh, when AZT was well, first came out, uh, you know, five times taking, taking pills five times a day with significant side effects, we've now moved to these you know, uh, fixed dose combination medicines, one pill once a day, truly remarkable that gives us tre tremendous results. And even if people can't tolerate these drugs, 
we have additional drugs in both the boosted protease, uh, with the protease class with boosting or with non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors uh, that also can maximally and durably suppress uh, HAV. Many of these also are fixed dose combination therapies. So one pill once a day uh, allows our patients to really achieve and maintain virologic suppression. And we look at data, we can see that why, why these are the recommendations and, and really how good the response rates are. I mean, all of us in our clinics here at Birmingham, uh, we follow 3,600 patients, 95% of whom are on uh, medications and 90% who are maximally suppressed. These are the results we see. And here are data from two studies from Gilead, the 1489 and 1490 study that just highlight this. Um, if we look, you know, whether people got Victegravir or, Dolu- or a Dolutegravir based regimen, the achievement of over 80% success is really remarkable. And it's regardless of people's age, both in the young, younger age group, less than 50, or the older age group, greater than 50. And yes, I will admit, I fall into the older age group. So sad. So the other thing that we've seen that has made success or maybe as a result of our success is a decline in resistance. And here's um, data that was presented at CROI last year as well. It is worth just reminding ourselves with the advent of more potent medicines, we're seeing less resistance. Um, And so here's data that compares 2012 to 2018. And in this analysis, what they did is they took all the individuals whose uh, HIV resistance testing actually had resistance. And, and only a third of the samples tested had resistance, so that's remarkable. And of those, there was a decline in the number of the, the individuals with, with two or more classes of resistance. So whereas in 2012, nearly half of people had two class resistance or higher, uh, in 2018, um, we see only 29%. And the resistance for both PIs and, and in NRT, and, and NRTIs decreased. Uh, and interestingly, despite the increased use of the integrase strand transferase inhibitors, we see a decline or at least a stable, stabilization of resistance to that class. And multi, multi-class resistance, uh, was significantly decreased. And so this really speaks to the availability and, uh, efficacy of our current antiretroviral therapy. Now, even for those patients of ours who do have limited treatment options, there are now there are options available. Fostemsevir, which is a new attachment inhibitor, has been approved. Uh, and what you can see in this study, the BRIGHT study, where they either, if people had uh, options that they could pair with, uh, then they were uh, randomized to get uh, Fostemsevir plus uh, optimized therapy or placebo. You can see 60% of those people here we're able to achieve success at two years, really speaking to the fact that even for these individuals, we have agents that can achieve success. So, so what are the advances that we can make to antiretroviral therapy to improve uh, on the success we've had? And long acting antiretroviral therapy really gives us that option. It provides a more convenient, less free, frequent treatment dosing for our patients and allows to address some of the issues remaining around uh, that make antiretroviral therapy a challenge for our patients. Stigma regarding the disease or the medications themselves for our patients who have large pill burdens, maybe not because of their HIV, but because of other medicines, if they have drug or food interactions. Uh, And then really the big one is adherence. So cavitegravir is an integrase inhibitor and ropivirine, a non-nuke, um, that have now been FDA approved as long acting injectable two drug regimen to maintain virologic suppression in people with living with HIV. And I'd like to share some data with you that, that has, that led to this, um, approval for, uh, 12 doses per year for these individuals, monthly dosing, um, uh, once they have virologic suppression. Um, and then as well, I'd like to share data from the subsequent study. Um, which hopefully will lead to the approval for Q8 week dosing and allow people to go to only six doses or six treatments per year. So this is a flare study. This is a phase three study. It was a, a multi-center randomized trial of people living with HIV who are naive to antiretroviral therapy, uh, didn't have evidence of hepatitis B and had no evidence of non-nuke mutations. 
Uh, and they were initially placed on an induction phase of dolutegravir, abacavir, and 3TC for 20 weeks. If they achieved virologic suppression, they were then randomized to switch to cabotegravir plus rolpivirine or continue on their oral therapy. If they were randomized to the cabotegravir plus rolpivirine, they actually received uh, one month of oral therapy given once a day and then transitioned as long as they tolerated the therapy into the injectable arm with injectable ca- intramuscular inject- injections of cabotegravir and ropivirine monthly. So I really want to just cut to the, to the data so you can see how remarkably successful this trial was. So people who enrolled in the study at one year were able to achieve 93.6% virologic suppression um, with only 2.1% of people having uh, a virologic non-response defined as a viral load greater than 50 copies per ml. So it demonstrated that cabotegravir plus ropivirine long-acting was not inferior uh, to the gold standard, which is a, a, a fixed-dose combination of an ingrace inhibitor with two nukes. Last year at Croy, Chloe Orkin also presented the 96-week data, which confirmed that there was continued uh, success with this regimen, with 87% of people achieving success uh, at two years, and only 3.2% of people uh, having virologic non-response. Really speaking to the success uh, of this regimen uh, in terms of efficacy. Now, a big question that people had is, what about uh, tolerability, and particularly with injection site reactions? Overall, the the, uh, treatment was very well tolerated. You can see with the initial dose was the greatest uh, occurrence of injection uh, site reactions with about 70%. Um, This declined to about 20 or 25% of people over the course of of the study at any any individual visit. Um, There were over 12,500 injections given over this 96-week period uh, and a total of 3,100 of those uh, resulted in an injection site reaction with 99% being mild to moderate uh, and less than 1% uh, being severe. Um, 89% of these resolved within seven days. um, And after week 48, only one person withdrew due to injection site reactions and one person withdrew because of intolerability of injections. Really speaking to the overall tolerability uh, of this therapy um, over this 96-week period. Now, one thing a lot of people have questions about is um, how are we logistically going to get people into our clinics uh, every month to get injections? It's going to require uh, a lot of manpower, a lot of people power to get that done. If we could go to Q8-week dosing, that would greatly help. And so the ATLAS 2M study um, is a phase three study designed exactly to address this. So here are patients who were either on the ATLAS study, which was a uh, partner study to FLARE, in which people were already on Q4 week cabotegravir plus ropivirine intramuscular, um, or they could be on standard of care, and then they were randomized to receive either Q8 week dosing or Q4 week dosing. If they were on oral therapy, they had a lead-in period of oral cabotegravir and ropivirine to assure that they could tolerate uh, the therapy. Uh, before initiating the monthly or Q2 monthly injections. And we presented this data last year at CROI. And what you can see is, you know, really astounding results. 94% of people on the Q8 week dosing and 93.5% of people on the Q4 week dosings were able to maintain virologic suppression at 48 weeks. Uh, with only 1.7 and 1% of people having virologic non-response defined as a viral load greater than 50. Now, in the interest of time, I didn't show, I didn't add the uh, the tolerability issues, but the uh, injection site reactions for this trial were very similar to what was reported in FLAIR as well as for ATLAS. Overall, extremely well tolerated with very few dropouts because of uh, injection site reactions. So that provides data on um, well-controlled or people initiating therapy uh, for this regimen. But I think many of us think that this type of therapy would actually be ideal for those patients who are struggling with it, adherence for whatever reason. While we don't have data yet on that, the latitude study 
which is an ACTG study, um, is going to address this very question. So this is the long-acting therapy to improve treatment success in daily life or latitude study to really address this issue of patients who struggle with adherence. Um, in these settings, long-acting therapy may actually improve success uh, by reducing the frequency of dosing for these patients. Furthermore, it may allow us to have directly observed therapy to increase their success. Um, so this study is currently enrolling and has enrolled 215 of 350 participants into step two. Uh, it's been delayed to some degree because of COVID, heaven forbid, um, but individuals who have failed therapy because of non-adherence uh, and including substance use issues that might be driving that, will be initiated on a standard of care regimen for 24 weeks. And if they achieve virologic suppression, will then get randomized uh, to either injectable therapy every four weeks or continue on standard of care uh, for 48 weeks. Uh, and then there's an open phase where those people who were on standard of care can transition into an injectable arm. For people who are interested in, in this study or have patients they'd like to think about um, referring, um, many ACTG sites around the U.S. are currently enrolling in this study, and we still have a way to go to complete enrollment, so please consider. But I think this is really exciting because for many of us, these are the patients who we'd like to see having long-acting therapy be a possibility. So it's really exciting now that we these two drugs, cabotegravir and ropivirin, have been approved uh, for people living with HIV who are on a stable suppressive oral regimen uh, with no evidence of previous resistance. Um, and hopefully that will expand over time. Now we do have another agent that is on the, is, should soon be, uh, well, it's, we studied in phase three studies soon, which many people have heard about is Islatravir. Um, so this, this product is from Merck, and this is kind of a novel agent, and it's an NRTTI, so it's both a transcriptase inhibitor as well as a translocation inhibitor, uh, and so it stops uh, um, viral transcription in two different uh, places, both by uh, blocking translocation and then by leading to delayed chain termination uh, by affecting the transcription. Um, so it allows two mechanisms. Now, what's really nice about this agent is it has an extremely long half-life, which can lead to um, less frequent dosing. Um, and so that's what we, I think, will see in the future for this agent uh, is the possibility. What we have thus far is a phase two study that studies Islactravir uh, plus Duravirine plus 3TC um, uh, versus Duravirine, 3TC, and Tenofovir. Um, ultimately, at uh, 24 weeks, the uh, 3TC will be dropped from the is, is, Islatravir Duravirin arm and, and allow for two-drug therapy. And once again, this ultimately uh, should lead to either Q-weekly or possibly Q-monthly dosing. And in this phase two study, what you can see is really robust uh, suppression uh, with all three arms with the Islatravir plus Duravirin. Um, uh, 74 to 90 percent, and this is going to lead to a phase three study uh, that are planned. And, and I think that the team is being really thoughtful. Obviously, they're looking at treatment naive patients, but they're also looking at switch patients and then also treatment experience, recognizing that these agents uh, have the potential to reach all of our different patients who struggle with adherence. Okay, so that's where I'm going to stop with antiretroviral therapy. Now, the exciting thing, I think, where we are now with the HIV continuum is recognizing that we can't just look one way. We have to look both ways on the continuum. And for those people living with HIV, uh, we stop viral replication. For those people at risk for HIV, we prevent viral infection. And so we can apply the same techniques uh, uh, for HIV prevention. So, you know, just a little... Uh, PrEP 101, obviously we must educate our patients about PrEP and, and what, what adherence means and what the drugs are doing. We have to make sure we provide sufficient support for our patients to have success with adherence. Um, we have to monitor our patients regularly to, to detect early HIV infection, look for medication toxicities, uh, as well as sexually transmitted infections. And we really want to maximize the pr protection against HIV after our patients initiate uh, PrEP. Um, now, one of the challenges that we know is that in terms of tenofovir, which is the, the most important agent 
uh, of oral prep so far is that it takes some time to achieve sufficient levels uh, in the rectal tissue or the, the cervicovaginal tissue um, to afford uh, our patients protection. Um, and there's a lot of debate in this area, and I think Dr. Buckbinder will talk a little bit more about this uh, in her talk. But when we think about our approach, we need to identify people with substantial ongoing risk for HIV, uh, make sure we, we do a comprehensive medical history to not miss any concerning comorbidities like hepatitis B or kidney insufficiency, confirm their HIV status, provide risk reduction counseling, perform STI testing, and then we can prescribe PrEP. And we need to prescribe it less than three months so we make sure that our patients are getting tested every three months um, and provided ongoing risk reduction and we can continue. Now, there are many barriers to providing PrEP. Um, I think for providers specifically, I think we do a poor job overall in terms of talking to our patients about sexual health and sexual wellness. Um, and I think that, that that barrier is one that we really need to work on in medical education. There can be some concerns for real world effectness, effectiveness and then unanticipated consequences. So uh, infection with resistance, safety to the pa patients, behavioral disinhibition and, and subsequent STI acquisition. Um, there's a lot of concern about who should prescribe it. Should it be the primary care provider or the HIV providers? And then there are a lot of logistical concerns. But overall, I can say this is a very rewarding part of my practice. Um, people who come to our prep clinic are looking to protect themselves. Um, and that is sort of a unique approach, trying to prevent a disease instead of treat one. And so I find it to be a really refreshing approach to medical care. Now, the challenge right now is that all we have is an oral fixed dose combination taken daily. While there are some intermittent strategies, in the U.S., I think most providers are comfortable with daily therapy for our patients. And so robust adherence is required to achieve sufficient drug concentrations to prevent HIV infection. Um, and, and while right now we only have oral therapy available, there are several agents long-term agents that have uh, a promise. So I'm going to talk about IM cabotegravir, briefly about oral islatrovir, and then about monoclonal antibodies. But there are other things on the horizon as well. Right now, there are two agents that are approved for PrEP, and these are both daily dosing, either uh, emtricitabine with either tenofovir uh, disaproxyl fumarate or with tenofovir alafenamide. And there are differences in those, and I know that Dr. Buckbinder will also go over those in her talk. The one thing to note is uh, the TAF formulation is not approved for persons at risk for HIV uh, from that receptive vaginal intercourse. So IM cabotegravir is exciting in that um, there are two studies that have been presented over the last year that have really demonstrated the efficacy of this agent to prevent um, HIV infection in both uh, men who have sex with men and transgender women, as well as a second study uh, looking at cisgender women that was just presented this last week. So first is HPTN 083, which present, was presented by uh, Rafi Landovitz at IAS last year, which was a phase 2B3 randomized double-blinded trial to prevent HIV in this population. So this were high-risk high men. Uh, it enrolled 4,570 individuals. Uh, two-thirds of whom were less than 30 years old, 50% were black. Um, patients were randomized to either tenofovir, uh, emtricitabine, or cabotegravir. In the cabotegravir arm, they took oral cabotegravir for five weeks, and, and then they initiated Q2-month intramuscular dosing. Now, this study was stopped early um, because of uh, a reduction in HIV infections, and you can see the numbers there, there were 13 infections in the cabotegravir arm versus 39 in the TDF FTC arm. And here are the, the Kaplan-Meier curves, and you can see these um, split very early. Um, uh, a hazard ratio of 0 0.34 with a highly significant p-value. Safety, obviously, is a concern. There were more injection site reactions in the cabotegravir versus in the placebo arm, but only 2% of the cabotegravir uh, participants uh, uh, discontinued because of injection site reactions. Cabotegravir was both non-inferior and superior um, to the oral PrEP. So this is really exciting data. And just this week, last week, we saw the data from HPTN 084, which was the partner study in cisgender women, where they enrolled over 3,200 cisgender women. 
with a median age of 25, 54% with greater than two sex partners. Uh, and once again, the same regimen uh, as in the previous study. And the DSMB stopped this study early as well. And you can see there were four infections in the cabotegravir arm versus 36 in the tenofovir arm. Here, so, you know, uh, I guess we, women have a higher threshold for tolerability than men. There were only 32 percent ISRs in the cabotegravir arm versus 9 percent in the placebo arm, and no individuals discontinued because of injection site reaction. And in this study, cabotegravir was superior to tenofovir in cisgender women. So these data are extremely exciting. This is Q8-week dosing. Um, a question about how long the lead-in will have to be uh, is an area to be addressed, but it's really exciting to see these data, uh, and we can hope that cabotegravir Q8-week uh, can soon be approved for PrEP and potentially it, when in combination with ropivirine for treatment of HIV. Now, I mentioned islatravir earlier. Um, we have now seen some data with islatravir for once monthly dosing orally uh, for prevention. Um, this is a phase two study that looked at two different dosing strategies of islatravir to get a sense of PK, uh, of the study. The doses were selected so they could maintain sufficient dosing to achieve a threshold to suppress HIV or prevent HIV infection. The preliminary data was just pre presented by Sharon Hillier, and the first 192 individuals have been uh, randomized. Both the 60 milligram and 120 milligram dose given once monthly have maintained uh, concentrations above the pre-specified threshold Overall, the both medications were very well tolerated and only two participants have discontinued. The full data set will be available later uh, this year uh, with phase three studies soon to follow. Finally, um, the AMP studies. Ooh, and I can just see I failed to update this slide. So there were two uh, studies um, in which uh, monoclonal antibodies, VRCO1 was used, uh, led by the HVTN um, uh, to prevent infection uh, when the uh, monoclonal antibody is given every eight weeks. In this study, it was versus placebo, although individuals in, in the trial could take tenofovir uh, m tricytabine if prescribed. Uh, and, and overall, these two, these two studies give us interesting data about VRCO1, uh, an HIV broadly neutralizing antibody ability to confer protection against HIV. And, and I think the most provocative data here is when they looked at virus um, that was uh, um, for the individuals when they were able to achieve um, levels above certain thresholds. Um, I'm sorry, when they with viruses that were susceptible to the agent below one uh, microgram, microgram per ml, uh, there was good suppression. However, for viruses uh, that required a higher level, uh, we failed to see. Uh, protection. So it really suggests that for this agent, there is, uh, it, it has possibility, but they will require either more robust, um, more potent broadly neutralizing antibodies, or a combination of two or more antibodies uh, to achieve uh, prevention of HIV infection. Nevertheless, this is a very provocative area for both prevention and treatment of HIV. So just in conclusion, we've had uh, HIV treatments expand, uh, advancing to degrees where, where we now expect all of our patients in clinic to achieve and maintain virologic suppress, and, and our patients are living longer with suppressed HIV and achieve an effective functional cure as long as they're adherent to their medicines. However, we still have a significant number of our patients who fail to achieve success with adherence playing a big role. So novel long-acting agents um, will advance the field uh, and, and hopefully lead to our efforts to really end the HIV pandemic on both the prevention and treatment sides when we look at the continuum. It, we can utilize the same long-acting medicines for both HIV and prevent, and uh, as well as treatment, and this will greatly aid in our ability to stop the HIV transmissions that we see. There remain a number of challenging questions about long-acting therapies uh, uh, like cabotegravir, particularly what about the long tail that these individuals have if they become non-adherent with therapy for both the people with treatment who, who are living with HIV and have the potential to develop resistance or for the people uh, living without HIV who could get infected and then develop resistance. We need to develop strategies to maintain adherence um, 
We also need to, to focus on how to prevent the development of resistance. And then there are a lot of logistical issues that we have to think about as we deploy these long-acting therapies in the field. Just practical things as we think about clinics, um, how they're going to manage patients. So I'm going to stop there. I don't know how I am on time. I'm good on time here. I'm You're doing to, fine. And I'm happy to take questions. Great. Well, there are a lot of questions uh, that have come in, so let's get started. Um, I think the first one really ties into what it is that you uh, just mentioned before at the end of your um, presentation, which is about uh, how to actually implement uh, these long-acting agents. And in particular, there was both a question about um, the concerns about potentially increased stigma for having to present to a clinic on a monthly basis for treatment or bi-monthly for prevention, but also in the era of COVID, how realistic is that? So are there strategies currently uh, under development for alternative ways of actually administering these long-acting injectable agents? Yeah, I think those are great questions, and I, I don't think we know exactly what I will say. I was, I was extremely happy to see the day after um, the FDA approval was, was received, the um, the Alabama uh, Department of Health put out guidelines to clinics about uh, some of the procedures they'll have to think about. I think there's still a lot of questions. Um, you know, can these be self-administered? You know, potentially, I guess that would be a possibility. Uh, can these be a pharmacy benefit versus a clinic benefit? Uh, another possibility. Um, you know, what exactly the the logistical issues are. I can tell you that I've been really intrigued by these agents uh, among our patients who have taken them, they've actually experienced um, sort of a, a decreased stigma and almost a liberation of not having to take pills every day. Um, yes, they have to come into the clinic and get injections, um, but I have many patients who have deep anxiety about missing pills even one day. And so having uh, just having to come get an injection once a month or once every two months is, is very liberating. So I think part of it requires us on the education that, that we afford our patients and, and really um, helping them overcome some of the, the stigmatizing aspects. But I definitely agree that these are the things we have to, to think about. The devil's absolutely in the details. Can you speak at all to this issue of um, poor adherence? And if you've got somebody who perhaps has poor adherence and doesn't show up for their regular injections, do we know anything yet about resistance um, and uh, the role of resistance in, uh, in people who are missing uh, doses? Yeah, so, so this is a, this is a great question. So, um, overall in, in, I mean, I think one of the things about clinical trials that make them a little bit, um, I don't know, unwieldy for, for practicality is that we're catching people very early. I will tell you of the people who failed in both the Atlas, uh, the Atlas 2M and the Flare study, uh, some of them did develop resistance to cabotegravir. Now, all of the people who developed resistance in those studies were uh, able to reachieve virologic suppression with oral therapy, and the vast majority of them still had susceptibility to dolutegravir within class. So I think that those data are very uh, reassuring. I think the concern that we have to a greater degree are people who disappear from care as we transition to giving this perhaps to uh, to a more marginal part of our population, and so our concern about that. There are some strategies in place already, so we there is a lead-in period that people are required to take to make sure they uh, they can tolerate the cabotegravir and ropivirine. Uh, we can also give people, you know, a, a, a extra amount of the oral therapy that can overcome if they're unable to get in. It'll maintain levels sufficient in their blood. I do think that this is a concern and it's something we're going to have to think about because, you know, if if patients get an injection and then disappear for some time, they can still have cabotegravir in their system up to a year later. And it may be a very low level, but it may be enough to induce resistance to this agent. So we do need to develop strategies for that. And I don't you know, I honestly don't think we fully have those uh, determined yet. Um, there is a question about uh, what we know about weight gain with cabotegravir. Um, do we know? Yeah, that's a good, good that? question. So in, um, uh, in I, I believe it's 083, but it may be 077, there was about a, a, a kilogram weight gain in uh, the prevention arm, uh, HIV uninfected individuals that one year who, who took cabotegravir, which was greater than seen with the, the TDF arm. Um, there has been weight gain seen uh, with cabotegravir 
in the treatment, cavitarivir plus ropivirine, although I have to tell you that it was not, as the studies were initiated, weight was not routinely collected. And so the data are really poor. As we move forward into additional studies, we'll gain a better understanding of the weight gain with cavitarivir. There clearly seems to be an effect of the integrase class, and what the meaning of that weight gain is unclear to date, similarly with the TAF versus TDF question. However, one thing that has been noted is that the weight gain with TAF is also associated with an increase in lipids, which may raise people's cardiovascular disease risk. I think we need to stay tuned and try to understand what the weight gain means. Great. Thank you so much, Turner. It looks like we're out of time in terms of additional questions, but that was a really fabulous overview of a really late-breaking field in HIV prevention. So I'll turn it back to you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. 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 Thank you, Pa